is a topic uh, which is uh, very technical uh, in medicine. So artificial intelligence is of great in interest for this field. Uh, before I go into the methods of uh, AI, I would just like to give you a short introduction about radiation oncology per se. So um, radiation oncology is composed of two words, is radiation and radiation is delivered by big machines, each costs about 2 million euros. And oncology means that the patient who is treated has a tumor and you have to somehow uh, hit the tumor by the radiation. And what normally is done is called fractionated radiotherapy, which means that the patient is not irradiated, irradiated only once, but up to 20 or 30 times daily. So this treatment may last uh, four or five or six weeks. And the machine that is used for this purpose is a linear accelerator. And this linear accelerator produces a conic beam. And this beam is directed to the patient's tumor. And it, this machine can be turned around. So the direction can be varied. And all these beams somehow meet within the tumor of the patient. These uh, radiation fields may be quite large. They may be two centimeters, three centimeters, but most of them are five to 10 or 15 centimeters in diameter. And in opposite, uh, sometimes you have tumors which are not so large, but which may be up to three centimeters, uh, which are very well demarcated. Uh, one example for that are brain metastases. And then you can use a technique that is called radiosurgery normally you only give one dose and this one dose is delivered by a very narrow beam so this beam is only something like five millimeters or one and a half centimeter wide and you have of course to be very precise to hit the tumor in this case and for this purpose you you have a whole system uh, which may consist as we have in cologne of a robotic uh, arm uh, where the linear accelerator is compactified and is mounted on this arm and you have an imaging system which with, with two cameras which control the position of the patient of the patient every second if you like and you have also a robotic uh, desktop where the patient can be positioned and repositioned and as I said normally with this kind of device you only apply one dose well, as you can imagine, the, the main problem is where exactly should, should you put the dose to? Uh, it may be easy if you exactly know where the tumor is. And here on the left side, you can see a delineation of a brainstem glioma. And in this case, the physician was quite sure, okay, this is, this is the tumor uh, and uh, it stops somewhere where the, where the red line is and he personally uh, had to draw this uh, red line just to, to outline the tumor. And then you can see here uh, a simple irradiation technique that uses um, several static fields. So uh, in total, we have four irradiation fields and they overlap and they produce a dose distribution and uh, this dose distribution is, uh, for example, marked with this so-called 95% isodose. So this is the, the relevant dose. And you see that the, the contour of this isodose line somehow uh, uh, similar to the contour of the tumor, but there's not a perfect match. Uh, but this is a little bit old fashioned, this kind of, of radiation technique. But just for illustration, this has been done up to let's say five years ago. And in this case, the patient had 45 grays in one gray, 1.8 gray fractions. So these are 30 fractions. And so it took uh, 30 days uh, for this patient to be irradiated. On the right side, you can see um, a patient with a glioblastoma, uh, which is again outlined in red, 
But in this case, uh, the physician is quite sure that there may be more tumor cells outside this visible tumor. And so he outlines another target volume, which is not called the gross tumor volume, which is inside here, but the clinical target volume, where you assume that there may be tumor cells inside that you don't see. And then um, you have to find a method, of course, to define this region. And in this case, a more sophisticated uh, radiation technique is used, which is called volumetric intensity modulated arc therapy. Uh, you just can imagine that the, um, that the linear accelerator is always uh, going around the patient in continuous mode. And from every direction, the, f the radiation field is adjusted to the contour of, of this volume. And in the end, you will have a dose distribution, which is very close to the contour. Uh, you, so you can really adapt the dose to the tumor. And also in this case, this was a fractionated radiotherapy and the patient had 30 fractions of, of two gray. And in opposite, uh, what we do often in Cologne, and you will, you will hear in my talk a lot of neuro-oncology because uh, this is uh, <laughs> where I, which I know best. Um, so here you see a typical case of a patient who is treated by a single fraction. And he has a brain metastasis, which stems from lung cancer. You can see it here. And you can probably also see the, the red line, which is again, the contour. And you can also see the, the yellow line, which is the isodose. And they are almost uh, indistinguishable because this is a very precise uh, type of irradiation. You see in this case, a lot of, again, static fields are used but these are very many static fields which are produced by, by this robotic, robotic device. And by uh, means of the whole procedure, you can apply a very precise uh, localized dose only to the tumor with a very steep dose gradient to, to the normal tissue. And if you are lucky, uh, your result will be like you see it here. You have the tumor before treatment and after four months, it's already very, very small and uh, eventually it will completely disappear. So many of these steps uh, can be uh, supported by artificial intelligence. And I have made a list uh, this list uh, is, contains five points and we will just go through, uh, through them one by one. The first is you have to, before you start therapy, you have to make a decision to, to perform radiotherapy and chemotherapy and you have also to choose the dose. And this is all indication, which means is there an indication for radiotherapy? And normally it may be, uh, based on genetic biomarkers. I will give you an example for that. But it may be that in the future, image biomarkers may be used as substitutes for genetic biomarkers. And I will show you an example for that. Then if you have made your decision, yes, the patient has to be irradiated. Then you, you have to contour or segment these target volumes that I mentioned before. Uh, mainly these are the gross tumor volume and the clinical target volume. And you, uh, you will, I will show you methods how that can be done automatically. Next step is then radiation treatment planning. Uh, I don't have too much material on that, but you can imagine that you want to have a high dose in the tumor and a low dose in the normal tissue. And that there are means by computers to help you, to help you with that. And then once, you have started treatment for, for the patient, you, you, you maybe may want to predict the treatment outcome. And this is in terms of response. So will the tumor disappear or at least uh, become smaller? You probably want to know if the patient has a chance to survive and how long, and also if he uh, will experience side effects. And then after the treatment is over, uh, you will do a lot of imaging, mostly it's CT and MRI, but also increasingly PET is used. And then you will often see changes in these images which are not easy to interpret. So it's, it may be 
that that the changes are just a side effect of the treatment, which may be radionecrosis. So it's really dying of tissue uh, due to the radiation. Or you might see a, a progression, progressing tumor, but this progression is not always true. It might be just, uh, how to say, reaction of the normal tissue. And then it's called pseudo progression because it spontaneously resolves. And there are also means to differentiate be between these image changes by artificial intelligence. Um, so we go to the first. Um, uh, before we go to the first, I have to introduce another term or method, uh, which is called radiomics. Uh, I learned that you already have some uh, had some lessons in, in, in deep learning, but radiomics is a little bit different. Um, I just want to cite this sentence, radiomic analysis is built on the central hypothesis that tumor imaging reflects the underlying morphology and dynamics of smaller scale biologic phenomena, including gene expression patterns, tumor cell proliferation and blood vessel formation. And for this purpose, you, you take the image uh, normally you choose the tumor image. So from, from the whole image, you select the image of the, of the tumor, and then you apply, well, let's say mathematical method, methods to extract features of, of, of this image. And these features may vary largely up to, let's say 10,000 have already been defined. Um, you can, for example, look for distinct binary patterns, which are uh, presented in, in, in this tumor image. You may look for gradients. Uh, you may look, uh, as in this example, for, for features which are present at different scales. So for example, in this case, you see areas of homogeneous uh, um, dark signal circles, which are present on different scales. And normally from, from this analysis, you get one feature value for each, for the whole tumor for each feature. So if you have, let's say 1000, 1000 features, you get thousand values for, for the tumor. And for another tumor, you get another thousand values. These features can then be used as, as image biomarkers and they have already been standardized uh, by an initiative which is called Imaging Biomarker Standardization Initiative. And there's already, already software available. Uh, the prominent is Pyradiomics and um, they have, this software has already many of these uh, standardized features implemented. So you have, don't have to redefine them. <clears throat> <coughs> Sorry. So this is again, the whole radiomics workflow. So you, you start with, um, with the image of the whole organ brain in this case. Yeah, then you have to find a method for segmentation, which can be a computational method or manual. And then from this volume, you extract the features. What you just saw uh, is normally called <coughs> textural features, which means, um, they are based on the um, relationship between the voxels and the neighboring watch voxels, if they have any pattern uh, in common. But you can also use first order statistics as just the statistics of, of the gray levels. Uh, and from this also several um, statistical uh, measures can, can be defined. You can also look at the shape of the tumor and what is very often done and very useful is that before doing this analysis, you make a, a transform of this image by, by wavelet uh, filtering, and then some of the features are more pronounced. But anyhow, uh, you come out here with something like between 500 and 10,000 features, and then you have to use, now we are again in the field of classic machine learning, you have to use a machine learning classifier. In this case, a support vector machine. And then you somehow have to correlate the classifier results with your with your endpoint, and this can be 
be done with a receiver operating curve, with, which is one method, but this is very often used. Um, I want to show you an example for radiomics based on image biomarkers as substitutes for genetic biomarkers. So what are genetic biomarkers? These are normally um, derived from the DNA or from other uh, parts of the cell and normally a pathologist does that. So you, you take a tumor sample and you analyze it. And in this case, um, it's about glioma, which is a most frequent brain tumor. And there is an enzyme which is called isocitrate dehydrogenase, and it may be wild type or mutated. And you can see here by the survival curves um, that the mutated, the patient where the tumor has the mutated enzyme has a much better prognosis than those where the tumor has a wild type gene. And there's another marker which is called methylguanine methyltransferase. And this is a pre, um, predictive marker. It predicts the response to one certain type of chemotherapy and also to radiotherapy. So if this um, enzyme is uh, suppressed, which means that the promoter is methylated, then you have a good prognosis, otherwise your prognosis is bad. But you have to take, you have to have a tissue sample for this kind of analysis. And also the rec the treatment recommendations uh, for for this uh, type of tumors are based on the um, genetic biomarkers. This is from the um, from the guidelines, from the ANU guidelines. and if if you have a astrocytoma, which has the IDH mutated, then you may wait and see, not treat the tumor because it has a very good prognosis and you can wait with radi radiotherapy until the tumor has some progression or whatever. But if you have the same tumor with a wild type IDH, then you should early start with radiotherapy. So it has really um, a meaning for the indication for radiotherapy. So if you, but if you don't have the tissue or if you don't want to take a tissue, then perhaps you can um, substitute the analysis by an image analysis. And this has been done by this group. Uh, it's from, Jap I think it's from Japan or maybe China uh, in 2017. And here you can see typical examples how these tumors look like in MR images. So in the upper row are all patients uh, with a good prognosis. Um, you see the tumors here, four tumors. And these are the IDHY type patients. Some of them, they, I think this looks a little bit different, but it's very difficult to tell by the eye whether these tumors are of the good or bad prognosis group. But if you now analyze these images uh, with radiomics, uh, you may be able to really um, tell them from each other. And this analysis started uh, with 600, 670 features and it used a feature set reduction procedure. This is very important because if you have uh, much more features than patients, you will always get some kind of model as you know, but this model does not mean anything. So you have to reduce the feature number. Feature number is still quite high after reduction. And then two types of machine learning algorithms were used. And then this um, model was tested in a validation cohort that the model has not, had not seen before. And you see that the AOC is about 80%, which is not bad. And another kind of analysis uh, that this group did and that can be done is to do a cluster analysis of uh, these remaining 110 features. And you can see that they can be clustered um, and that uh, in two clusters, this is the first cluster and this is the second cluster. And within these clusters, you can see that most of the wild type um, tumors belong to the first clusters, while, while most of the mutant type 
uh, gliomas belong to the second cluster. So <clears throat> this whole analysis seems to be reasonable. And if the patient says, okay, I don't want to be resected or even uh, a biopsy, uh, I don't want a biopsy, then maybe these image markers may help uh, the neurosurgeon or radiation oncologist to decide uh, how to uh, um, go for therapy with this patient. Okay, but once you have um, decided to treat the patient, you have to um, segment or contour the target volumes. Normally, uh, this is made by manual segmentation, but there are also automatic uh, measures to do that. <clears throat> and there is one um, segmentation benchmark. It's a, it's a challenge, so, so it's an international challenge where you can um, find out how good your, your software is. It's a very prominent challenge as far as I know. And within, this is just an example how, how this software is developed. And within this, this challenge, you get a set of images and you have to train your program to do the segmentation automatically. And what, what you normally would segment uh, in a patient with a glioblastoma is the contrast enhancing tumor tissue, which you see here, which is um, which is uh, white, almost white. The non-enhancing tumor, which is which is not so easy to see, which is uh, about here, and then you have the necrotic tumor tissue, which is inside uh, the the, tu the tumor and the brain edema. And if you have a sh sufficient um, segmentation, you could perhaps use these three for the definition of the GTV. So this would be something like this. And then you could, this is one uh, procedure, you could use the edema as a CTV. It's, it's not always done like this, but, but you, could, you could do it like this. Um, so the question is now, how can, this is a manual segmentation, how can the manual segmentation be automated? And I know, um, I think you have already heard a little bit about deep learning. The one very famous uh, deep learning model is the deep medic network. It was developed in 2017. And you probably already know all these steps. So you have the convolutional layers and in the end you have the fully connected layers. And in this case, you will not have a classification, which is let's say, uh, uh, for the whole tumor, but you have to somehow develop a classification for every voxel of the image. And this is partly achieved by uh, looking at the image in different resolutions, a normal resolution and low resolution. And after the network has uh, found the um, best convolutional filters and uh, putting everything together and then in the end the segmentation will result. And in Cologne the radiology, radiological department has also a lot of experience with, with this network and they have in two, 2018 have uh, first trained or used the trained network which was trained on, on this uh, challenge da data and then they evaluated it with their own patients. And this worked very well. In this case, you can see a glioblastoma patient and you can see that the, the necrotic tumor, which is um, magenta in this case, and the contrast enhancing tumor, and also the, the edema are really segmented which, with high accuracy. Um, a further development, for, let's say, which probably started from the deep medic, uh, are the UNET type uh, convolutional neural networks. They have a more complicated structure, but the principle is that this, um, resol this uh, resolution, or let's say these scales of resolution um, are, um, th this principle is, is further expanded. So when, when you start with the original image, it's down sampled in many steps uh, and a lot uh, and an increasing number of filters is generated, 
but at every downsampling step, the, the pictures with the low resolution are concatenated with pictures who have been generated from upsampling again, the downsampled filtered images. And this results uh, in a very accurate um, segmentation procedure. And in 2017, um, the group who, who won this challenge, again, this BUTS challenge, uh, was the group around Fabian Isensee from, from the German Cancer Center. Um, and so they won this challenge and you see an example here. Again, you have the tumor, um, which is depicted in the T1 contrast enhanced MI image and the flare image. You can see this is what's the ground truth in this tumor and this is the uh, computer-based, uh, unit-based segmentation. So it's very accurate. And we also did uh, a comparable analysis. We tried to segment metastasis for the purpose of radiosurgery. Uh, there, you normally assume that the GTB is the, oh, PTB, I did not define that, but it means just that you have to find the border of the tumor that is enough. Uh, so it's just segment the tumor, nothing else, no edema or so. And we um, used this uh, unit from Heidelberg and we trained it on 500 patients and 2,100 metastases. And then we compared the segmentation performance um, with the manual performance. And in about 80%, in about 50%, we had a very good dice score. The dice score gives you just um, a measure of how good the segmentation is. And you can see that it's not perfect, but for these small tumors, it's, it's good. And another 37%, it was, it was fair uh, and also some small metastasis uh, remained where it was poor. But maybe this is also, is already at the edge of clinical use because it's a very elaborate task if, task if you have five or eight metastases to really contour them all manually. And maybe in the, fut in the future, this can be done with this, with this automated segmentation algorithms. Okay, now we have the segmentation. Now you have to go to treatment planning. Um, I, I'm not going to be uh, go into detail with this very much, but I was I just want to show you one system, which you, we, well, let's say one software, uh, which can be used with a dedica dedicated system. And um, it's from the um, company Brain Lab, and uh, it's called Brain Lab Elements. And it's a dedicated software that automates planning for multiple brain metastases. This is an example from a publication. And you can see this, this is a, the manual uh, treatment plan. And this is the automatic treatment plan. And it's almost as good or maybe even a little bit better than the manual treatment plan. And um, if you go to the website, uh, you can see what, what this algorithm does. And it treats all the brain metastasis from one single isocenter. Um, well, this is a little, little bit radiotherapy technique, but it's just, that means that you don't have to reposition the patient during this procedure, which you normally have to do to put each of the metastases into the isocenter, isocenter of, 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 of the linear accelerator, but you don't have to do that. And with this automated treatment planning, you, are, you can generate a, a plan very fast. Okay, so once um, you have treated the patient, uh, you would perhaps like to know how the response uh, is, whether he has risk for recurrence, for recurrence or whether, how long he will survive and if he will develop side effects. And um, there's a very famous paper uh, from um, the Heidelberg group and they uh, trained uh, images from glioblastoma patient, patients and they were able from to predict from nine features, which had been select selected out of 10,000, just to predict the survival prob probability of these glioma patients 
uh, from from the imaging data. So this is uh, what has been repeated severally, but is one of the main papers. And another another possibility is not to only, as I told you, generate one feature for um, the tumor as a whole, but to generate feature maps. Uh, this, ha this has been done here. And you can see that this, these are quite old features, but, but they are still valid, I think. Uh, for example, for this feature entropy, this has been expressed as a feature map. Um, again, in glioblastoma, you, you, so you see the tumor and and the edema in, and in the edema zone, which looks quite homogeneous in this image, you can see that the patients with a short survival have a, have a differing feature map compared to those who have a longer survival. And if this was further developed, you could perhaps predict where the uh, recurrence uh, the next recurrence develops. So I think this is one of the uh, one of the promising uh, developments for radiotherapy. Um, this is a, a paper from from our group. Um, here we use the cyber knife to treat lung tumors. If you see a you see a patient with a small lung tumor, he gets an, uh, a, a very circumscribed irradiation, and in this patient, a local lung fibrosis develops. And this patient was also treated in this almost the same way, but no reaction of the lung developed. So we try to predict who's the patient who will develop this kind of reaction. And then we developed a model, uh, which included about 10 features. And then we found that if we combine um, radiomics features, which, which you see here, and also dose features, and clinical features. So this is the age of the patient. This is the mean dose in the tumor. This is the mean dose, is the maximum dose in one millimeter, one milliliter of the lung. So if you combine these radiomics features with dosimetric and clinical features, you, you can get a quite good um, prediction. Uh, this was, was very um, good in the training set. And then we also used a complete independent test set from another institution and, and it still worked. So it seems that also this kind of prediction is possible. Okay, now we come to the last point that is differenti differentiation of treatment related tissue changes. Uh, just go okay, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. We are approaching the end. Uh, yeah, I have only two more slides. So okay, I will, then okay. we have time for a couple of questions. <laughs> okay. Okay, I will very fast. So um, this is a patient who had radio surgery, and after radio surgery, we, we see these imaging changes. And actually, it's very difficult to find out whether this is a radio necrosis or a recurrence. And we did a radiomics analysis based on fat pet and MRI. And to be short, uh, if we take the five most predictive features uh, from both modalities, we get an AUC of uh, above 95%. So this can be done. And this is a comparable kind of analysis where we looked at pseudo progression and also the combination of FedPET and MRI uh, gave the best results uh, for predicting uh, this event. Okay, so now this is my last slide wide range of uh, artificial intelligence applications in radiation oncology, many tools at the edge to clinical application. Models are still based on small number of patients. Uh, so they, and they have to be evaluated in different settings and external data sets are, are really needed. Multimodal imaging is very important. Um, and you can also, include the dose distribution in the predictive models, which has been done sometimes. It would be nice to have risk maps so that you can in advance plan where to, where to put your dose. And this is, uh, is also a new development. If the patient's anatomy changes from day to day, you, you can adapt uh, the plan by means of AI. Okay, that's it, it was. <laughs>